Hello, my fellow Jackets fans. Welcome to episode 9 of Boom and Gloom. I am Anthony. I'm also known as Whaler Jacket in all those social media circles out there. And I am Ohio's longest suffering hockey fan. Here to talk some Blue Jackets hockey with you. Now, um, I tried to, when I started this podcast, I, um, I said that I wanted to keep all episodes 30 minutes or less. And I, I'm not sure if this one's going to stay below 30. I hope it will. But I do have a lot to talk about. And also have to say that with the Elvis Merzlikens news that just popped up yesterday, um, that's kind of thrown things for a loop as to what I really wanted to talk about. And uh, so anyway, I'll, um, I'll, I'll touch on the Merzlikens situation uh, towards the end but uh, what my plan is, I kind of want to let it digest or fester, um, and then maybe next week talk a little bit more about it. So, so um, onward and upward here. Um, first thing, first segment today I'd like to talk about is Yarmo again. Seems like um, just seems like that's a very common topic on here. I think I've talked about him several times, but how could I not? It's newsworthy stuff. So, those of you who know me well know that I hate, hate conflict. I hate it. I will usually do whatever it takes to avoid any conflict with others. Now, as a teacher, I do my best to avoid uh, confrontations with angry parents. And um, so, I played hockey since I was nine years old, and I've never been in a fight. I I've just always found it unnecessary, at least for for me. Um, it's just I've never gotten to that point where I've felt I needed to uh, fight somebody. Yeah, I've, I've had some pushing and shoving matches. I've said some pretty harsh words, but never a fight. Um, I even won the equivalent of the Lady Bing Award in both youth hockey and high school hockey. So my 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 theory or whatever behind that is that people don't have to be best friends with one another. They just have to respect each other. And I even say that to my students all the time. You don't have to be best friends. You just have to respect each other. And that's why Twitter drives me bonkers sometimes. They're, they're people who sit behind their keyboard in the safety of their, their own home, and they just like to stir the pot. And then they get under people's skin uh, saying things they, they don't need to say or saying them in... In a, in a disrespectful manner. That That's the main thing. It's just the way they say them. And it drives me crazy. So I saw a post on Twitter the other day that I really wanted to comment on, but I held back because it was a polarizing issue and I didn't, I didn't want to get involved. Again, I, I shy away from conflict. I, I didn't want the person who posted it to feel like I was attacking him or his position on the topic. So instead, I decided to come here and figured I'd discuss what I want to discuss without the constraints of character limits and without without feeling the need to defend and argue my position. The post in question uh, centers around our beloved general manager, Jarmo Kekalainen. Someone, and I'm not mentioning names, decided to call out Blue Jackets fans who criticize every move Yarmo makes. His point was that Yarmo has done some great things during his tenure here, and nothing truly bad this year. So basically, he was just saying he was tired of seeing the constant Yarmo slander. Okay, so he, he was just defending him. Well, I am here to say that the slander is warranted, and... As I've said before, people have the right to fan the way that they want to fan. So first of all, Yarmo has in fact done some bad things this year. And actually a very bad thing this year. The very bad thing, he hired Mike Babcock as the head coach. That was actually one of the worst moves he has ever made as a general manager. Maybe the worst. Before that, he attempted to upgrade, quote-unquote, upgrade our defense 
by trading a first and second round pick for Ivan Provorov. So far, all you Jackets fans out there, do you think Provorov is worth what we paid for him? I firmly do not. Yarmo also signed Damon Severson to an eight-year contract. Eight years. Do you think that was a good signing? At this point, I do not. Now, maybe I'll change my mind on that further down down the road. But right now, I don't think he's living up to the length of that uh, length of that contract or the term. Um, and finally, another bad thing that Yarmo has done. He has failed to clear out the log jams on our roster. I mean, we currently have three goalies in our rotation. We have an abundance of forwards. We have extra defensemen when everyone is healthy, of course. And he, he's apparently been trying to make a trade since the summer. And, and that just screams bad job to me. Okay, I, I know it's hard. I get it, but you got to get it done. Okay, our our offense is great this year. I think our our goaltending has been average. So what's really bad? What's really contributed to the record we have now? It's our defense. And who built that defense? Yarmo. So don't tell me the man has done nothing bad this year. Then another po- another uh, poster uh, pointed out that uh, Yarmo got Panarin for sad for uh, sad for sod in a trade. Yeah, he did. Yarmo has indeed won trades, several of them. Okay, but I go back to an analogy that I've used before, and I'm actually quite proud of. Winning a trade is like me trading a. Uh, Dollar General brand coffee for a Starbucks coffee. Sure, I won the trade. I got the better coffee. But you know what? I don't like coffee. I don't drink coffee. So the trade has not ultimately benefited me. So this is what Yarmo winning trades is like. He gets the player that looks better on paper, sure. But ultimately... The trades have not resulted in any sustained success for the Blue Jackets. Another poster pointed out that Yarmo is responsible for a lot of the young talent we have on the roster. Well, here's my problem with that statement. Yes, we have a lot of young talent. And yes, Yarmo did bring a lot of that talent in. But why do we have that young talent? Because we had high draft picks. And why did we have high draft picks? Because Yarmo put together a bad hockey team year after year. It's a vicious cycle. Okay. And and here's another thing. If if I was the GM, even I could pick Adam Fantilli, okay? I I could pick Kent Johnson and Cole Sillinger and David Yurichek and uh, Denton Matejuk. I could do that. Let's not praise Yarmo too much for being a drafting genius for drafting these guys, all right? These were picks that any of us could have made based on the, the scouting reports and the hype. I personally went into the most recent draft thinking if I had my pick after Bedard, I'd pick Fantilli. So if I was somehow swapped with Yarmo the moment before he made uh, that third draft pick, I'm taking Fantilli. It's a no-brainer. That wasn't a, a draft genius move. That was just common sense. And you know what? Once we had Fantilli, I started thinking, if Brinley is still available when it's our next pick, I would take Brinley. So I'm I'm just an average Joe Hockey fan, okay? I mean, I... <laughs> And I would have made the exact same picks. So, so let's not go overboard on the on the Yarmo draft praise. Okay, what defines a great drafting general manager is the ability to find high end 
uh, talent in the later rounds. Now, in my opinion, Yarmo has not done that. Okay, I mean, all right, let me rephrase that. So he he has done some of that, but not enough to be considered a drafting genius. And to be fair, um, he did go off the board to grab uh, Chinikov. And right now, that's looking like a better and better pick. I will admit that. And let's not forget, he shocked everyone by taking Pierre-Luc Dubois. Now, I know that ultimately did not work out in the long run. But at the time, it did yield a fantastic first-line center for us. At the time. So, Yarmo has made some good drafting decisions. But let me ask you. Have any of them helped convert this franchise into a perennial winner? They sure haven't. So yeah, you could argue. Argue that uh, Yarmo's made some great draft decisions, but but not great enough to put this franchise on track to sustain success. So with, with that in mind, I would say ultimately Yarmo has failed in terms of drafting talent. Another poster said that we had some success back when we swept Tampa Bay, but then Yarmo's hands were tied with the departures of Bread, Bob, uh, Anderson, and so on. So he had to rebuild from the ground up. The poster also mentioned that a rebuild rebuild should take five to seven years. Tell that to the Winnipeg Jets. Tell that to the Vancouver Canucks. Tell that to the New Jersey Devils. Or even Philadelphia Flyers. All teams who recently had minimal success, but then they were able to take huge strides to do excellent trades and drafting. And I suppose I should throw in their uh, developing players as well. So I get the point that a rebuild could take a long time. But seven years is a stretch. And and seeing what other teams have done to turn around their franchises, it, it just screams to me that Yarmo has made, um, or has not made, the right moves to put this team on the correct path. Other teams have shown it can be done, and uh, can be done quickly. Well, relatively, relatively quickly, but, you know, a few years. What are the Jackets on? Is this year four? This is, is, this is either year four or five of the rebuild. So I, I think it's year five. I think it's been five years since that uh, Tampa Bay sweep. Something like that. So that brings me to the point that I have made repeatedly on this podcast, on Twitter, and to anyone else that will listen to me. Yarmo needs to go. We need a new GM with a new vision. We need someone who can assess our current talent and then make roster decisions based on that vision. And it needs to be done now, before the trade deadline. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening. And that just contributes to the frustration that we as fans continue to feel because of this franchise. Yeah, Yarmo Yarmo deserves Every bit of criticism he receives from us fans who just want our team. We just want our team to be a winner. That's all. And Yarmo's been here a long time. I want to say I want to say he's been here the third longest of any GM in the league. The, th- the third longest for a team that has one of the worst records during that time and, and the least playoff success. It just just doesn't add up to me. I mean, why why are we keeping this guy around? So frustrating. So yeah, yeah. Yarmo deserves the criticism. But going back to what I said earlier, speak your mind, guys. Speak your mind, but be respectful about it. Disagree with someone? Fine, but politely disagree. I really think we're just all frustrated as Jackets fans. But keep in mind, we all want the same thing. We love our team. 
We just want to see a winner. So let people fan the way they want to fan. All right, let them express their frustration, how they want to express it. And know it all comes down, it, or it all comes from the, the, the same place. From the love of their favorite team and their desire for them to be a winner. Finally, after all this time. Oh, now, I, pre I prepared all that, and then the Elvis news hit yesterday. So, I'll have a little bit more to say about Yarmo after the next segment. So, so let's get on to that next segment. Trade bait. Unless things change dramatically in the next month or so, and let's face it, I, I doubt they will, the Blue Jackets are going to be sellers at the trade deadline. Or will they? With so many teams up against the cap, it may be hard to find dance partners. So I wanted to take a look at some of the possible trade candidates on the Jackets. Very few I would classify as completely off limits. But I want to focus on a few who I think would be very logical candidates for a trade. So let's start off with uh, Jack Rosovic. Quality, skilled, veteran player, pretty good hands, can score, and he's a player on an expiring contract. So I really think Jack is a uh, top candidate to be moved by the deadline. Uh, the next... I'm going I'm to group the next three players together. Uh, Jake Bean, Adam Boakvist, Andrew Peake. And I put all these together because they all still have some upside. And I would say Boakvist has lots of upside still. And they're relatively inexpensive. And I say relatively compared to uh, the contracts of players like Wierenski and Goodbranson and, and Severson. Okay. So... I would say two of these three could and maybe should be moved. But we all know that uh, supposedly, supposedly Yarmo has been working on these on trades for these guys since the summer and hasn't been able to pull anything off. So, so I have no, I don't have faith, I don't have confidence that they will get traded. But I I see them as candidates. Number three, Ivan Provorov. I really think Yarmo swung and missed on him. He should have never been brought in for a team that was rebuilding. Now, he has done, I would say, a fine job. All right, not a great job, a fine job. But we already have too many defensemen in that same mold. We have too many who are offensive minded, risk taking defensemen. What I think the Jackets need is more defensive defensemen. You know, the, the rough and tumble, stay home physical defensemen. Maybe like a, like a David Savard type player. Let's face it, our defense is not good. I would say it has been, it has been what has really held us back as a team this season. It's our defense. So let's part ways, ways with him, all right? Find a trade partner willing to take him in, not just as a rental, but as a contender who is in the middle of a uh, window for playoff success in the need, uh, or who needs that style of defenseman. Going to be hard to pull this off, but I think it's possible. Next up on my list, Alexander Texier. I like the guy, but I think he needs a change of scenery. When he left two seasons ago, he was arguably the Jackets' best forward. Now he's just a shadow of that. Uh, now I know he's he's had some personal things going on that may have contributed to the setback. But he's currently filling a fourth-line role. Now I, I say that, and I know that there's been some uh, lineup changes a little bit, so he, I think he might be playing a little bit higher now. But, but for the most part this, this season, he's been cemented into that fourth line role and we have plenty of players who could step in uh, into that role um, 
down in Cleveland. I mean, we have Trey Fix Wolanski for one. So I would say Bon Voyage detects if I could find a taker. The next one, Justin Danforth. Now, I am saying this as someone who considers Justin Danforth to be his favorite player. Okay, I love the guy. I have a I have a soft spot soft spot in my heart for the undersized player who is not afraid to get into the corners, um, not afraid to be physical, but also uh, be on the receiving end of physicality, and just always gives his best, always gives a hundred percent. So I love the guy. I love his heart, his energy, uh, his determination. He's exactly what some contender could use to bolster their team for a playoff run. And he's relatively cheap. Cutting him loose would open the door for another vertically challenged player like um, TFW or um, next year with Dumay and Brindley in the mix. So it might make sense to consider moving him. So those are those are five right there. But... I want to add a couple more. All right, I'm going to say it. Patrick Laine. He would actually be number one on my list. Number one. All right, I want him traded away more than any other Jackets player. I just, I don't see his fit into the roster, and I truly believe the Jackets are a better team without him. The problem is that contract, and no, no one can afford to take him. But I wanted to add him here because... It still could happen. If a player is put on long-term injured reserve, line A maybe could be brought in until that team's playoff run is over. And after that, the cap goes up for next season. So there's a small chance, a, a small, small chance that line A gets traded in this manner. What I don't want to see is the Jackets trading line A and being forced to retain a ton of salary or take on other high contracts. I mean, that's just not worth it to me as a rebuilding team. And the other person I wanted to add to the list was Elvis. I will talk about him shortly because, again, this this whole Elvis situation just kind of sprung up on us. So it's kind of um, changed changed what I wanted to talk about here. Anyway, so that's it. That, that's my trade bait, my trade bait list. Everyone, everyone else on the jackets, you're safe. Now, you may have noticed I did not list Emil Bemstrom. And that is because I just don't think he has any trade value right now. I really feel if he was sent to a, the AHL again, he'd pass right through those waivers. And if he was claimed, so what? The salary comes off the book, as little as it may be. And that's enough of a return, in my opinion. I am off the Bemstrom train, and I have been off that train for a very long time. It's time to vacate his roster spot and let someone new step in and fight for a spot on the big club. I mean, let's let's pull up somebody from Cleveland and, and see what he's got. Because, again, this season's over. This is a lost season. So we might as well see what we have. Let's try some other guys up there and, and see what happens. And now, my next segment, Elvis Merle- Elvis Merzlikens. What in the heck is up with this? Elvis hasn't played in a game since December. Our supposed number one goaltender has not seen the ice. In fact, he's, he's been a healthy scratch. He hasn't even been on the bench as a backup. There are so many questions that this raises. Before yesterday, I was thinking of the following possibilities. I was thinking there's a trade in the works. I was thinking there's a rift somewhere. He's not not getting along with the coach or he's being disciplined. I don't know. Maybe he's fighting an injury or a serious illness. Highly unlikely, but I thought it was a possibility. Or there's something going on that we're not thinking of. This, This whole situation is just very, very strange. And then the bomb drops yesterday. Elvis and management are thinking a new scenario, that's the word they use, scenario, would be beneficial for all parties. So it certainly seems 
now that um, Elvis's time in a Columbus Blue Jackets jersey is coming to an end. Unless, unless, maybe that, maybe that scenario changes a change in the GM in front office. That would be a possible scenario, right? No, I'm kind of half kidding on that one. Now, before I go any further, uh, I have been on the trade Elvis bandwagon. All right, I, I admit that. He just has not, he's not been the same since the death of Matisse Kiblenix. Now he's improved this year, but but you can you can tell he's he's nowhere near what he used to be. And I I truly think that's not his fault. All right, I I I really believe that. And I have been on the bandwagon simply because I think he could use a change of scenery, and I, I think that would be best for him. And because I think the Jackets need a better goalie. But do they? Okay, the Jackets' garbage heap of a defense might be where we should be directing a lot of the blame. But regardless, I thought, uh, still think, that trading Elvis might be the best thing to do. The problem is that darn contract. Okay, that thing is an albatross for a below-average goaltender. So I told you I'd be bringing Yarmo up again. Who is responsible for that bad tra- bad contract? Yep, Yarmo. Back when it was signed, uh, I questioned it. I thought it was giving it was giving someone too much for too little a body of work. And lo and behold, it turns out I was right. Now I say that with a caveat because. I might not have been right had Elvis not experienced such a terrible tragedy. Uh, I, I, I've had I've had two dogs pass away in the last seven months, and I I still I still cry when I think about them. There are there are constant reminders of them around my house, and. I, I can't even imagine the reminders that that Elvis sees every day at the rink. It must be must be horrible. It must be incredibly difficult. So if circumstances were different, maybe we're having a different discussion right now. Maybe we're talking about Elvis's uh, Vesna season, this season, or last season. You just can't say. But we can say that Yarmo handed him a contract that has now handcuffed this franchise. Yet another blunder by this GM, and yet another stain on this organization. We keep showing, um, we keep showing up in the media for the wrong reasons. But one thing I will say is that Elvis has handled this with class. He has stated he is not giving up. He has stated that he loves Columbus the city, his team, his uh, teammates. He loves it. But the Blue Jackets organization is treating him like crap. Why is he not playing at all? Why hasn't he, why hasn't he even been a backup on the bench? Just an absolute embarrassment of a situation and the way it was handled. And I'm just flabbergasted that it keeps happening. No, it. I shouldn't be. I mean, I, I should be used to it by now. But this is just another example of why Yarmo needs to be relieved of his duties. It's just one thing after the other. I mean, every time the Blue Jackets find themselves in uh, the media, it's for the wrong reasons. All right, I, I might have more to say about Elvis Um Next week, once I can digest this a bit more, once uh, maybe more uh, news about the situation comes out. But for right now, I'm just going to move on to my final segment of the day, and that is Bright Spots. I like to do this every episode. Um, I like to list a few positive things going on with the jackets. Can't be all gloom all the time, right? The problem is, since I last recorded, there's only been one game, and it was that stinker against Winnipeg. 
And speaking of which, when are the Jackets going to be this season's Winnipeg or or even Vancouver or Philly? When are we going to be that team that overachieves or, or comes out of the gate and surprises the heck out of everyone? We had that, that one year where we finished uh, fourth in the league or whatever it was and had to play Pittsburgh in round one of the playoffs. So I guess that can qualify, but but to me it doesn't feel like it. I, w- I, want that, I want that wow season where we shock the hockey world. All right, anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm I was, sorry about that. Got off track. Um, so let me get back to what I was talking about. The bright spots. Tough to do right now. In fact, I usually try to pick five, but that's not going to happen this week. So I have, uh, I have two. Two bright spots to talk about. Bright spot number one is Cole Sillinger. I think this dude may be coming into his own. Now, no one scored versus Winnipeg, but I believe Cole came the closest. He rattled one off both posts and a centimeter uh, to the right or left, and it's a different story. We have a goal. My only fear is that that this doesn't um, derail him again. Because I remember during the first or second game of Cole's second season last year, uh, he had a goal waved off for being offsides. So again, that was like the first or second game of the year. Then it was like months before he scored again. So hopefully that doesn't happen this time around. Bright spot number two, the injury to Jordan Dumais. So on Wednesday... Wednesday and Thursday, rumors were running wild that Jordan Dumay, one of the Jackets' top prospects, was going to require double hip surgery and, I think, hernia surgery. By Thursday afternoon, those reports were being refuted, and the word coming out was that he was going to be out six weeks with a lower abdominal injury. So that is some... Very good news. All right, there, there's a, there's a good chance um, that Dumay would not be able to fully get back to where he was after something as serious as double hip surgery. I mean, that's, I mean, that could be, you know, devastating to a career. I mean, there's always that chance with any surgery for a professional athlete, but, but at least this news is better than that. I mean, that, I think that's a positive. Injury is not as bad as reported. And that's all I got right now. I know it's not much, but without many games this week and with the, the shutout loss and the, the huge Elvis debacle, I admit I was grasping at straws for that. So, yeah. All right. Time to wrap it up for this episode. I really appreciate any of you who have actually made it this far. I'm very strongly considering experimenting with uh, having some guests on next week's episode. I'm hoping to have some fellow fans on here to talk some Blue Jackets hockey with me. So if you're listening to this right now and you're interested, please shoot me a DM DM on Twitter and and let me know. My handle is Whaler Jacket. Um, Also hit me with any questions or suggestions for the show, like suggested topics, I love giving my opinion about the jackets. I can't say my opinion is always the correct one, but but I just enjoy sharing my views with anyone who will listen. So thanks for tuning in, guys, and uh, hope to see you next week, and go Jackets!